Welcome to the webinar. Um, this webinar is the development of long-term low, emission, low emissions development strategies. We will talk about recommendations and uh, sharing of experience. And this is a webinar from the CBIT platform. My name is Anna Cardozo. I work at the UNEP TTU partnership, where I am uh, working in the project, uh, the CBIT platform. And I am the moderator for today's webinar. I greet you from Copenhagen in Denmark. Before we move to the main content of the webinar, I just want to share uh, a couple of housekeeping informations. The webinar is going to be about one hour, including time for questions and answers, which will be um, from you to our speakers. And um, I encourage you to ask questions at any time. Please use the panel of GoToWebinar that you have standing on the right side of your screen. You can write your question, and uh, if you want to direct to, to a, a particular speaker, please write the name of that person. And in case you cannot stay until the end, uh, all the the, um, the slide, you I mean the slides and the recording of the webinar will be available online in a few days on the CBIT platform, in this link that you can see in the slide. We have other webinars and information there, so you may want to check this um, this link for for more interesting content. I would like to inform you that we comply with the um, European Union General Data Protection Act, the GDPR. Means that this means that your personal data, like your name and email and workplace that you sent us to register for this webinar, is uh, safely processed and stored and your rights pursuant to the GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data you share with us, and at any time you can request that the data is deleted or, mod or modified. For access or for changes, please contact these persons you see here in case you want to, to have something removed or, or um, uh, modified. And now for today's webinar, we have a great agenda and uh, a very nice uh, panel of speakers. We have two presentations. The first one, it's going to be about designing the climate, the climate change strategy for Chile. And we'll have Soledad, Soledad Palma from the Climate Change Office of the Ministry of Environment of Chile. You you can uh, while you listen to the presentation you can ask questions and we will um, we will take those questions after the presentation or in the end in case they only come later. After this talk about the climate change strategy for Chile, we will have um, an overview of and recommendations for long-term low emissions development strategies, and this will be a talk by Chiara Falduto. She works at a climate change expert group of the OECD. And we are very, also very eager to uh, hear what she's going to tell us about these uh, long-term low emission strategies. And again, if you have questions, we encourage you to, to have them. We'll, we can send questions during the presentations or at the end, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can during the webinar. So having said this, now it's time for the first um, talk. And uh, I would like to ask Soledad to please um, talk to us about the experience of uh, developing the climate change strategy of Chile. Thanks, Anna. Uh, good morning here in Chile. First, thanks for the invitation to the CIVIT platform. And I hope that everyone is well. Um, sorry for my English, it's not the best. At Let's go to the presentation. Well, uh, to start, uh, I want to talk to you about the first step of for, for the development of our LTS, which was our climate change law. Uh, why we, we develop a climate change law? Uh, because in Chile, we don't have a regulatory framework for climate change management. Of course, uh, we have relevant institutions and instruments as, such as our NDC, our National Adaptation Plan, uh, sectoral plans for mitigation and adaptation and so on. But we need a strong architecture or, or structure to organize all the relevant stakeholders and instruments. Therefore, we develop a very strong and open participatory process for the development of our climate change law. 
we went to all regions of the country. We have 16 regions in Chile, and uh, we went two or three times each. And uh, we start with an early participation for the elaboration of the draft. And when uh, with this draft, we started a citizen consultation process and we received around 4,000 contributions. We used these contributions for improved our project. And the main contribution, contribution for the citizens uh, were related to water security, to the role of the science and scientific committee, the subnational commitment, and education and capacity building. And I want to add also that this law was signed by 15 ministries. The main objectives of the climate change law are first, of course, our long-term target, the carbon neutrality by 2050. Another uh, objective is to establish obligation and responsibilities at national level at, and subnational levels for all sectoral ministries uh, to establish mandatory citizen participation for all sectors to incorporate the science as a key actor for climate decision making at a high level, to establish management, command and control instruments, to recognize the NDC and as an intermediate, intermediate goal, and to establish MRB system for all the commitments of the law. Uh, if we see the contents of the law, uh, you can see I, I only put here some main contents of the law. Of course, we have the mitigation target. We also have adaptation a paragraph in the law because we need to work uh, strong in, in to develop targets and indicators for measure adaptation. Uh, in the third uh, paragraph of the, of the law, long, medium, and short-term management instruments of command and control, we include our LTS and our NDC. Also, the law uh, includes a paragraph related to the incorporation of climate change into other policy. Also include financing and economic instruments. Also information systems. Here I'm talking about the national GHG inventory system, also the national prospective system, not only for GHG emissions, but also for black carbon emissions. And also Huella Chile program. Uh, Huella Chile is a program for private sector. Uh, the idea is to work in climate change management with uh, companies and all, all the private sector uh, which are making some things in climate change issues. And finally, uh, of course, a very relevant chapter in the law is the institutionality of climate change at national and subnational level. The second step of our LTS is our NDC, which was published on April 2020. Um, and it's very relevant because it's an intermediate intermediate goal between the current status of our GHG emissions and our carbon neutrality goal by 2050. Our NDC include a mitigation, adaptation, and integration commitments, and a very relevant um, new pillar, the social pillar. I don't know if everyone here know about a uh, Last year in Chile, we lived a complex political and social crisis. And it was a big challenge for the government um, to how to consider um, this demand from the people. But I think it was a very uh, great opportunity to discuss uh, more about the social aspect and how, how to put the citizens in the top of the iceberg. And now, uh, these social pillars, pillar takes more, even more relevance into the current scenario of pandemic. Regarding to our mitigation goal, uh, let me give you first uh, some context about our previous NDC. 
here you can see our previous NDC of 2015. Uh, this previous NDC was very criticized. Uh, it was an emission intensity target, and it wasn't considered transparent and ambitious. Uh, I agree with that. Therefore, during 2019 and 2020, we developed a strong modeling process together with energy, transport, meaning, agriculture, waste, every sector. And uh, we include not only stakeholders from, from public sector, but also from ONGs, private sector, and universities. And we uh, elaborate, we, we develop this new MDC with all this uh, through this strong participatory process with a, a multi-actor exercise. And uh, with that, we could obtain a more transparent and ambitious goal aligned with the Paris Agreement requirements. And also considering that science has shown us that temperature increase is directly related to the accumulation of emissions, we include this carbon budget goal too. Uh, also, in our NDC, we uh, include um, integration commitments for forests, oceans, peatlands, and circular economy. And we incorporate adaptation commitments too. I'm not going to read every commitment, but I'm going to talk about some of these commitments. For example, if you see here, uh, one commitment is to develop sectoral adaptation plans. We have, we just have nine sectoral adaptation plans and we are working in two more. We compromise also regional action plans and we have now, we are working now in four regional plans and the idea is to have 16 because we have 16 regions in the country. We are working too in a climate risk map at a community level. And we are making, we are working with a, a expert from one university in Chile for the determination of cost of inaction. And we are implementing a national disaster risk management policy. Well, let's go directly to our LTS. Why we develop our LTS? Of course, considering Paris Agreement, which established the obligation to submit and update the NBC and to encourage all parties to submit long-term strategies. Also, we consider um, OECD recommendation because during 2016 or, or 20, 2017, sorry, I'm not sure uh, about the specific year, but three or four years ago, OECD gave us recommendation uh, because they support us uh, giving uh, analyzing our climate change management instruments, commitments, and stakeholders involved in climate change management. And they recommend Chile to identify long-term trajectory consistent with the goal of zero net emissions in the second half of 2050s. To design our participatory process, we use all the experience of the world. We review LTS from of different countries, and we make uh, meetings with countries of the regions, which have uh, LTS as Costa Rica and Mexico. And uh, we also made meetings with uh, other countries which are developing their LTS now. Uh, such as Argentina, Colombia, and Peru. Uh, and also, um, very relevant, we have permanent communication with UK because as we include in our climate change law, our LTS will include sectoral carbon budgets based on UK system. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, our NDC include now a carbon budget, a national carbon budget, uh, for the period between 2020 and 2030, but our LTS is uh, going to include um, 
sectoral budgets, or, I mean sectoral goals. And we are going to use the, the system of UK as a reference. The participatory process started in May 2020, and now we are working in more than 80 workshops, including gender approach and considering different uh, stakeholders from public sector, private sector, academy, civil society, youth, uh, regional uh, stakeholders, experts, indigenous people, and communities. And the idea is to have uh, in April of 2021, the draft of our LTS. Then we are going to start the citizen consultation process. This is, this is a process, uh, it's a legal process in Chile. We have a law uh, that regulates a citizen consultation process. Uh, therefore, we need around four or five months for this process and then the idea is to present our LTS in COP25. The principles of the LTS is first the social pillar, same as in our NDC, and we are going to link uh, our commitments with the SDG goals. The second one is the cost effectiveness. We are going to consider social, environmental, and economic costs for all the mitigation and adaptation measures. Science as base of, for decision-making. And the fourth one is integration. Uh, here we, I'm talking about the national and subnational level. How, how to incorporate all sectoral plans, policies, strategies, and so on. Under development, or, or under implementation if of, is, of course, a challenge. For that, um, we are working very close with all sectors involved in climate change management. Uh, these sectors are, for mitigation, we consider eight sectors, which are intensive in GHG emissions. And for adaptation, we consider 11 sectors, which are more vulnerable to climate change. And we are working with all these sectors. And beside that, we have a relevant group um, called Interministerial Climate Change Team, which, in, which is integrated by 20 ministries. And that's very useful for the coordination and the coherence and to make synergies between each instrument. And related to the participation mechanism, Two relevant stakeholders during the process will be the advisory council, com the advisory council COP25. Uh, this is a high level council created under the Chilean presidency of COP25 and a scientific committee for the relevance of the science in the decision making. Um, now, if we see uh, the details of participa participation instance, uh, you can see that we are doing uh, first uh, six sessions of cross-sectional groups. Here we are talking about three main issues, human settlements and life in communities, solution based on nature, and transition of productive sectors. And also we are working now in 32 working tables for defined objectives, sectoral objectives, sectoral policies and instruments, methodological proposal to determine sectoral goals. Here I'm talking about carbon budget, as, I'm, as I mentioned before, and a, to define proposal of adaptation targets and indicators. To, to evaluate or to monitor the adaptation capacity of the country. And to assess integration, uh, we are going to uh, develop 16 regional workshops for some national integration with the central level, including regional climate change committees. We have 16 regional climate change committees. An advisory council and majors, 
and 16 regional workshop for climate action and regional integration with ONGs, academy, uni, unions, and youth. And finally, I want to highlight the role of international support during, during the past, of course, during the, the development of the climate change law and the process of updating our NDC. And now, uh, international support is key for uh, helping us with the financial and technical support for the elaboration of our LTS. I think it's, yeah, it's the last one. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Soledad. It was a uh, wonderful talk, a lot of details. I have two questions here that I uh, would like to ask if you would, would mind responding. And so if you, if you have this uh, present or if you can give us like a rough estimate, how long did it take from, from start to the end, uh, the process of developing a long-term strategy in, in Chile? Yeah, uh, perfect. Uh, well, we start with our uh, participatory process on May, and the idea is to present the final uh, LTS in COP25. I think, therefore, I think that's around two years. It's a lot of time, but the idea for us is to make this a strong participatory process, including all actors from public sector, private sectors, ONGs. We also are including now indigenous people. We are considered a gender focus. We are also including youth, uh, because during COP25, we, we have a lot of participation from youth. Therefore, now we are using this, this uh, feedback, this a relation with them. Uh, we understand that it's a lot of time, but we, we think that you need to work with the people to ensure the sustainable of the instrument and the one, because you know that in Chile, we change our government every four years. And sometimes this political change generates uh, impact in climate change or other sectoral policies. Therefore, if we work with all the cities, with all the country, uh, these uh, instruments are strong and can ensure the, the permanency in the time. Great, perfect. And the other question is, what were the main challenges of this process? I it's, it's still an ongoing process. And how these challenges, I mean, you can, you can maybe speak about one or two challenges that have, have uh, happened so far and how, how were they ad addressed? Thanks for the question. Yeah, first, of course, the, the current scenario under COVID-29, COVID the pandemic, uh, because uh, it was the first time to, to start a participatory process, to develop a participatory process in, I don't know how to say that in English, but uh, quarantena, we, we have to, to be only in houses. Therefore, uh, the workshops need to be virtual workshop only. And we, we work a lot of, with people and it's difficult to use. A, well, we, we, we had to, to learn about different platforms, web, web platforms to work with people. But at the same time, I think that it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's maybe an opportunity because Chile is a very long country. And, and with this virtual workshop, we can work with all the people from all the citizens, of, for all the cities of the country. And that was a very good opportunity to, to improve the participatory process. And another um, challenge, I think, is how to involve all sectors. Because sometimes uh, some sectors, some ministries are more active or proactive and, and other sectors are not so uh, motivated for climate change management. At the same time, if, if the measures need a lot of money, a lot of, uh, if, if some ministries uh, need to address a lot of barriers, they are not so sure to participate. Therefore, to include all the ministries and to, to ensure this coherence and coordination is always a challenge. Thank you for your answer. Um, we have now more 
people interesting to know more about <laughs> what you just told us about. And we have a participant that asks, what was the total budget involved in the development of the long-term strategy for Chile? Do you have an idea, a rough estimate of a number for the total budget? Well, first, uh, to be honest, uh, we have only international budget now for our LGS because considering social crisis uh, of last year and now uh, the current scenario of pandemic, we are um, we are receiving help from different uh, countries, from international uh, countries uh, for the process. I, I don't know if I can. Share my screen again. I have a, a table with all the, all the details. Here I have all the institution helping us and the activity, and you can see how uh, the budget related of each activity and the, how much time we need for that. Uh, I don't have the, the number because we have a, a different type of uh, units, but I can send you then the, the information. Thank you. We see it's a, an effort with many um, many parties chipping in. Yeah, it's, it's like, a, how do you say, a rompecabeza? I don't know the name, but uh, we need to, to make, it's like a car, you need different... Uh, Partnerships with multiple... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. And the it's complicated to organize, community. but we are trying to make synergies between each uh, support and not to to repeat activities, of course. Great. It's good to see the international community to chip in and to support these efforts. Um, I have more questions for you. I'll save it to the end uh, because mm -hmm. now I also have um, um, Chiara that is going to, to tell us about um, the recommendations and and to to know more from the technical technical point of view of uh, how to develop these long term low emission development strategies so chiara over to you thank you we'll talk a bit more later so that uh thank you anna and hi everyone uh once again anna thank you very much for inviting me here today to to present on the subject and also thank you Soledad, for for the great uh, presentation, as, as you all will hear soon, uh, a lot of the elements that Soledad has already mentioned in her presentation will be present also in mine, uh, although mine is a bit more of a general overview of what are led, what elements should they include in, in this uh, these um, types of recommendations. Um, so just to, to begin, just, just to say that this presentation is largely based on, on two recent uh, CCXG publications. The CCXG is a team I work for at UACD, and uh, its main aim is that of stimulating discussions on a variety of issues that pertain to the climate change negotiations specifically, but lately we've been doing also some work that relates to the implementation of the of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so the presentation will be structured more or less into blocks. A first block, uh, which is based on the first presentation that you see on the left of the screen, uh, which will focus specifically on LTLEDs and will provide an overview of what are LTLEDs, why are they useful, what elements they can include, and what are the key steps of setting up an LTLED process. And the second part, uh, we'll aim at investigating a little bit more the linkages that exist between long-term strategies and NDCs, and we will be looking at why and how uh, long-term strategies can be useful uh, in the midterm, uh, can be useful to inform the mid-term targets that are uh, put forward in the in-countries NDC. Uh, so to begin with, um, just to provide, just to yes, to set a little bit of ground on what we're talking about. Uh, there isn't a set definition of LTLEDs. Uh, however, for the purpose of this presentation, we can intend LTLEDs to be national, subnational, or supranational long-term strategies for envisioning a low, uh, a low emission development, while considering also broader national priorities that are in line with the decarbonization pathway. Uh, importantly, LTLEDs are voluntary strategy documents, and so their uh, countries can develop them if they want. Uh, they're very national specific, so LTLEDs make change accordingly to uh, specific national circumstances or specific uh, needs that a country may have. 
uh, low emission development strategies are not a new concept in the domain of uh, climate policy planning, and they have already been mentioned in the Copenhagen Accord. However, they have been this tool has been picked up also by the Paris Agreement. Article 4.19 asks uh, all countries all countries should strive to formulate and communicate uh, LTLEDs, uh, mindful of the long-term goal of the Paris Agreement. So considering this context, and also uh, as the name as the led suggests, uh, we can say that there are three foundational elements that define uh, LTLED. Firstly, they are long-term, so they set a strategy for the long-term. Uh, this is particularly important because uh, LTLEDs are meant to set a strategy that can lead, that can successfully lead a country to, towards uh, decarbonization. Um, and given the very long um, lifespan of most infrastructure assets, uh, usually uh, when we look at an LTLED, we look at a strategy that looks at least 30 to 50 years forward. So for developing, for LTLED that are being developed today, we deem that uh, a milestone to 2050 is uh, deemed as a, as a suitable suitable target. Uh, secondly, of course, they set a, a pathway towards a low emission future. Once again, LTLEDs are very country specific, so it is up to countries to determine what uh, would be an ideal uh, low emission pathway to follow. Uh, however, we know that especially in the context of the Paris Agreement, these LTLEDs are to be developed mindful of, of the goals set in Article 2. And we also know that from most recent available science, uh, the IPCC special report on global warming, uh, that uh, at the global level, in order to achieve, uh, in order to ensure um, uh, an increasing global temperature of not more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, the international community should reach carbon neutrality by around 2050. And we see that some of the some countries that have developed at the left have indeed. Uh, included goals uh, of carbon neutrality to 2050. Uh, finally, very importantly, LTLEDs have a focus on development. Uh, LTLEDs are in fact development strategies, which yes, of course, they have to aim uh, to climate change mitigation, but also uh, they are to ensure the um, overall improvement in the well-being of a society. And so, depending on the country-specific circumstances, they could include, include other uh, developmental goals, such as a reduction of poverty, or for example, improved education, food security, or improved health conditions. Um, we can say, well, developing an LTLED is very important for countries. This is what we found, and there are several reasons for, for, for this. Um, the main, well, the main reason for why for for which develop, uh, developing an LTLED is important is because uh, LTLED allow countries to adopt a more holistic view for policy planning, and in this way they can facilitate the achievement of a wide range of objectives. So to avoid undesirable overlaps, we can identify five main opportunity areas uh, that arise from the development of LTLED. Firstly. Uh, they enable and facilitate deep transformation within an economy. Uh, in fact, by adopting a long-term perspective, LTLED can help countries to uh, identify some key areas where transformation may be needed and implemented so to achieve such, such transformation. Secondly, and very importantly, they facilitate uh, policy alignment. Uh, developing a long-term strategy that is economy-wide can help governments to ensure that effective alignment of policies uh, is achieved in the diverse areas or sectors, and it can help countries to ensure that climate change mitigation is integrated with other social and economic objectives. And also, it can help countries to start think about how different policies can interact with each other positively or negatively as well. Thirdly, um, stakeholder engagement. So the development of an LTLED, as also Soledad mentioned uh, in her presentation, is a very big opportunity for countries to engage a variety of stakeholders. And this can range from the civil society to academia or to the private sector. 
and uh, producing an LT lab that is motivated by a shared vision, vision so that it's the result of stakeholder consultations can also help to promote the acceptability of ambitious climate action within a country. Fourthly, uh, LT lab can raise trust at both the international and, uh, and at the national level. At the international level, this is because, uh, as we see, that most a lot more and more countries are putting forward clear plans on how they uh, aim at achieving a low emission future. Can create a positive feedback loop, as by uh, whereby other countries are motivated to 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 undertake similar actions as well. At the national level, it can incentivize in promotes trust and it provides some sort of regular, regulatory certainty, for example, for the private sector, which is thereby more motivated to undertake actions as well in terms of climate change mitigation. And finally, this is particularly important for developing countries, uh, international support. Having a clear plan of uh, where the country wants to go or where it, it will be in 50 years and highlighting wh what are key uh, investment areas or investment opportunities can send important signals to donor countries uh, for um, to call for, for climate finance. Of course, uh, there are many other uh, variables also that, uh, that would affect the total flows of climate finance, but uh, definitely developing an LTLET can, can send an important signal in this turn. Um, well, as we have mentioned throughout this first part of the presentation, the most important thing, the value of an lt led does not lie simply in the output document itself, but rather in the development process that leads to the formulation of that very document. Uh, and so for countries uh, taking the time and, invent, and investing time in setting up an appropriate lt led process is fundamental to develop a, a strategy that is meaning, meaningful and effective. This is particularly true as we uh, consider that the holistic nature of this strategy requires uh, a whole of government approach that is involving as many ministries as possible, as many agencies as possible in the process. And in order to do so, uh, a lot of coordination across ministries and agencies is, is required. And so it is important to plan ahead. So we have identified four main steps that countries can go through as they prepare or set up their lt led process. So first, getting start started. Uh, what is important for countries to do is to look for what is already out there in terms of existing strategy that, strategies that the country may already have, uh, targets that it has already set, or institutional arrangements that are already in place for similar mechanisms and can and that could be used uh, to develop an lt led as well. Uh, this can make sure doing this exercise allows the country first to understand its starting point, to understand its potential, but also to avoid um, duplication of work, because perhaps there are already some resources out there that can be used. Uh, after that, um, the country can proceed by understanding uh, what would be the best institutional setup that can coordinate the development uh, of an lt -led. So importantly, in a first step would be that of defining a special body that can coordinate the whole process, that can co uh, make sure that the different ministries or agencies talk to each other. Um, at this point, also political leadership could be very important. So the, endorsement, the endorsement from a political leader, for example, can uh, promote the role of the lt -led itself and make sure that it's, um, that it's uh, uh, that it has a strong, uh, a strong role in the in the in the policy area of the country, uh, vision of the country, uh, and then at this point, it would be also very useful for countries to think about setting up a process to engage stakeholders. And this is a process that has to last throughout the developing the development of the LTLED. Thirdly, developing the LTLED itself. Uh, so this is um, probably the, at the core, of course, of the of the LTLED process, and um, this step includes setting a long-term vision, 
that the strategy is, aim, is to aim for. The vision can be more uh, aspirational or can include uh, quanti quantitative mitigation targets. Uh, in general, it is important uh, that the strategy include also more specific targets against which progress can be measured. And uh, it is also important that the strategy includes a long-term financial and investment vision, which could include, for example, the identification of national resources or funds that are readily available in the short term for the implementation of the strategy, so that the country makes sure that uh, what is proposing in its lt led uh, can be somehow supported by, by financial resources. And uh, finally, planning ahead. So uh, making sure that there is a plan for the implementation of the strategy, which would involve uh, defining roles and responsibilities um, for the implementation of the strategy, but also planning a little bit for the future. Uh, lt led because of their very long time, uh, time horizon, uh, lt led are, are to be seen as uh, living documents. That is, it is very important for a country to make sure that the lt led is reviewed constantly and uh, periodically so, to, so that it can be adjusted to uh, new scientific evidence, to new studies or to, to new technologies that are available, to new changing, to changing circumstances or even to, 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 new, to new ambitions. Uh, now, uh, very quickly, because I think I'm running a little bit uh, behind, um, but uh, just to, give, to provide a looking at the strategy itself, uh, we will just have a very quick look at what are the elements that an lt lets could include. Uh, once again, uh, I will never stop repeating this, but uh, it's very important that also countries, um, based on their circumstances or their needs, can adjust these elements uh, as they as they wish. So overall, we have identified six blocks that could be included in a strategy. So a long-term vision, which we have already discussed, a quantitative and economy-wide long-term GHG emission reduction target. Uh, this target can then be split up into sectoral targets, can take various forms. We have seen countries using very different targets. For example, what Chile was mentioning, carbon budget, so something that many countries are using as well. Uh, thirdly, uh, it's important that the, 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 the Delta led is supported also by a variety of goals that go beyond climate change mitigation, but that promote also other uh, well-being goals. Uh, the adaptation component is also very important. Some Delta led include this, and this is particularly relevant for vulnerable countries uh, for which uh, climate change adaptation could be a precondition to climate change mitigation. Uh, fifthly, a finance and investment strategy, as I already mentioned, important to make sure uh, that there are the resources or that there is a plan to make these resources available in the future to implement the strategy and a plan for uh, implementation and monitoring of the strategy. Um, this is, uh, I just tried to provide a quick overview of what were the main recommendations that we have document. Uh, the document also includes a long list of uh, guiding questions that can be useful to countries that are in the process of uh, setting up or that wants to set up an lt lets process. And so I invite you all, all of you that who might be interested to, to have a look at this, at this question. The, the, the document also provides a, a brief overview of, of what is already out there in terms of what countries, what are, what other, what countries are, are doing in terms of, of lt uh, Looking at international experience, in fact, is, is very important. And this has also been underlined by Soledad, how Chile has taken inspiration from, from what other countries were, were doing. Um, not surprisingly, we have seen that uh, all the lt are, um, that are published to date uh, focus on climate change mitigation, and most of them even set uh, quanti quantitative uh, emission reduction targets. Uh, the, the plans all include uh, comprehensive sectoral coverage, so they include multi-sectoral plans that cover all sectors of the economy. Uh, however, a thing that we notice is that there are still 
weak linkages with NDCs, SDGs, and other developmental goals. So perhaps this uh, perspective of linking climate change mitigation to other than socioeconomic uh, factors is still uh, missing a little bit from, from, from the uh, strategies developed thus far. And so with regards to this last point, since we have seen that uh, the weak spot of nearly all these strategies related to the linkages that these strategies present with the countries and with the countries and DC, we have decided to further investigate uh, this issue. Uh, in fact, we find that the long-term perspective in lt -Led is very useful to inform and generate momentum for NDC's short-term action. Uh, lt -Led can definitely help countries to identify the long-term mitigation opportunities for transformation in all sectors of society and the areas where near-term action is needed to support such transformation. Uh, so we definitely see that lt -Led, other long-term strategies or even climate or carbon neutrality goal can feed into the NDC process and vice versa, the NDC process can also have some information that could be useful uh, in the whole lt -LED process. So, for example, lt -LED could inform short-term targets or mid-term targets by ensuring that the mitigation pathway uh, included in the NDC is consistent with the carbonization pathway identified in the lt -LED. So ideally, the NDCs would be milestones to a longer-term uh, decarbonization pathway. Uh, but also, very importantly, long-term strategies, so the long-term perspective of long-term strategies can support the NDCs as it facilitates consideration of both current and future mitigation opportunities. So signaling what area, in which areas it is important to act now to unlock future mitigation opportunities. Uh, to, to support these points, uh, that, to, to support this main thesis that uh, the long-term strategies are very important for NDCs, we have looked at eight different uh, case studies that analyze how a long-term perspective can uh, influence uh, NDC. NDCs. Uh, I will not talk about, I will not go through all the case studies here, so I have only picked one. I have picked out one for you, uh, which is one of the most significant as well, and it relates to the French transport sector. Uh, so in this specific case study, uh, this specific case study uh, shown how different the policy mix of achieving a 2030 target would be based on whether or not a 2050 target is also taken into account. So for example, in the column that you see there on the left of the screen, uh, show what type of policy France would have to undertake in order to uh, reduce uh, emissions from the transport sector by, I think, 40%. I can't remember the exact target, but it might be 40%. And without having also another longer term target in, in, in mind. So they only want to achieve the 2030 target. And as you can see, this target can be achieved by focusing on energy most by mostly focusing on energy efficiency of existing vehicles. However, if, if France were to include also a longer term target into the picture, and so would want to achieve the same 40% reduction of emission by 2030, but then achieve a more ambitious reduction in 2050, then the policy mix, the most uh, cost-effective policy mix to achieve both targets would dramatically change. Uh, in fact, in the second case, with a 2048 target in mind, um, we see that to achieve the 2030 target, it's already necessary to also invest in technology change and uh, fuel switching. If the country does not is not prepared to do so and does not do so, achieving a 2048 target from 2030 might still be possible, but it might be at that point more, more expensive. Uh, so just to outline a couple of uh, um, key uh, key messages that uh, that uh, came out from our from our analysis, long-term goals can substantially shape short and mid-term priorities, as we have seen. Long-term strategies are key to lay the ground floor and unlocking future mitigation opportunities. A long-term goal is important to give a clear direction of travel for the short and mid-term. And long-term strategies can facilitate the identification of risk of carbon lock-in, informing short and mid-term action accordingly. Uh, finally, 
uh, in our paper, we have also uh, tried to outline some options that are available to countries that are planning on um, updating their, their NDC in the, in the near future. And uh, these options are based on three different scenarios that countries may find themselves with in, sorry. Uh, in the first case, the country already has a long-term strategy, and this is a bit of the ideal uh, uh, situation where a country already has a long-term plan. Uh, the, it can, the country can decide to update the, the long-term plan if new scientific insights are, have become available in the meantime, and the country can use this long-term plan to inform the NDC. In the second option, in the second case, a country is developing both an LTLED and an NDC at the same time. This could be uh, quite cumbersome to do, and so it would be useful for countries to develop between a sequential process whereby the LTLED is developed first and afterwards the NDC. If this is not possible, in the, if the two are developed at the same time, it's important to make sure that the two processes talk to each other so that the two teams are in, con in contact with each other, making sure that the two documents are aligned. And finally, a third case, a country will develop in, uh, its NDC in the absence of a long-term strategy. This is, of course, uh, an undesirable situation, but perhaps some countries may not have the resources or the time at the moment to develop an LTLED as well. And so, if, for example, these countries could look at, at what's already there, as we mentioned, so existing strategies, existing goals, but also existing studies, regional studies, national studies, that can, could provide some could provide some insights on um, on what could be future opportunities for low emission development. And uh, when developing when updating the NDC, they could also focus on uh, how to best avoid risks of potential locking. So to conclude, the two key messages uh, of this presentation are that on the well, on the one hand, developing an LT led is very important as in an, as an opportunity for countries to consider climate change mitigation in a broader socioeconomic perspective, to engage stakeholders to create a long-term plan capable of addressing needs and concerns of communities, and to develop a coherent and aligned set of policies. Um, and ideally, it would be important to set up an LTLED process so that it would fit into the NDC process, as the longer-term perspective allows to consider future trends, including availability and cost of technologies and systems. And uh, thank you very much. Sorry if I was very long. <laughs> thank you, Chiara. It was a really complete and detailed presentation. And now we have time for a couple more questions. And I invite everyone in the, um, attending the webinar to submit their questions. We'll try our best to respond uh, to the questions here. And the ones we cannot respond, we'll try to get uh, a written uh, answer and we'll publish together with the recording of the webinar. So you, your questions will be answered at some point, if not here, <laughs> later in written. Chiara, um, I ha have two questions for you and I have then a couple more for Soledad. Uh, basically, I would like to ask if, if you have this impression uh, about what are some common pitfalls of the process of developing the, the long-term strategies that countries need to be aware of? Yes, thank you. Um, well, you know, this is a very tricky question as in, uh, it really depends on the country. We have seen uh, very different challenges across the country that we have analyzed. In general, I would say that perhaps uh, many countries find it difficult to coordinate um, among uh, different ministries. So to make sure that different ministries, different parts of the government are involved in the process of developing an LTLED. This task is often um, uh, led by the Ministry of Environment, which is uh, absolutely fine, but uh, not always uh, other ministries are, are, are involved. And so it is very important that, that these processes are taken in a in a really economy wide uh, with an economy wide perspective and uh, by really adopting the a whole of government approach so that i think would be one of the, one of the main challenges that could be common to to all countries it means that um, the institutional arrangements part is something that always needs to be worked on for yes. for these processes exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah, and there is another question. Let me just grab it. Um, a participant says, in spite of long-term strategies and climate action plan in place, what is the main challenge for our inability to reverse at least small visible change in the process of decarbonizing economy in real time? Do you have any comments on this? I can read Sorry, it again. You, yes, yeah. please, the first part I missed. Yeah, it says, in spite of long-term strategies and climate action plan are in, being in place, what is the main challenge for our inability to reverse at least small visible change in the process of decarbonizing the economy in real time? Do you have any comments on this? Uh, how can we... <laughs> <laughs> this is a very complicated question, I would say, yeah. a complex one. And of course, I don't have the answer in my pocket, but I would see it as a little bit the other way around, as in, this is really my personal impression, is that sometimes there is not enough long-term planning, as in there isn't enough long-term planning. Uh, we don't really know what, where we want to be exactly 50 years from now, and so we are not able to implement the short-term steps right away. So I would say that this whole exercise uh, would really be helpful in this sense as well, as it would really make clear to governments uh, what are the short-term steps that are really needed to unlock future mitigation opportunities. So, uh, because otherwise we cannot proceed without a longer-term perspective in mind. The, the short-term steps, the, the short-term actions that are needed to implement, that are needed to be implemented now are really dependent on, on, on a more long-term vision. So, so, so yes, I would say that um, that it really depends on the context and uh, on on where the specific country or the international community wants to be. Thank you. Thank you for your comments to this. And another question for you, and then I'll I'll move on to uh, Soledad to to ask ask her uh, an, another question that we receive. Um, if you have any thoughts about what kind of skills do you think the countries need to have in their teams, in the Ministry of, uh, or in the Department of Climate Change in order to conduct this process, have, have you, do you have any, any thoughts about this? Uh, we have, this is a very good question and we have really touched, we haven't really invest, investigated a lot this issue in the paper, although we wanted to. Uh, of course, having some types of skills of modeling is very important. Uh, I was just saying that this is a very uh, interesting question and a very important one. We have not investigated uh, this issue very much in our paper. Um, but I would say that definitely uh, modeling is important. Uh, modeling ex exercises are very important to support the strategy. So this is definitely a skill that a country would need. If the country does not have the capacity to have these types of skills, then it could seek support from uh, international organizations, from the international community. But also there are a lot of resources out there produced by academia and, um, and think tanks that can also uh, be used by the country to support its strategy, uh, the, the strategy, while, of course, the country is working on um, creating some some knowledge in this sense within the country that can be used also in the future. Thank you. I'll now ask uh, a couple more questions to Soledad and then I'll come back because another one came for you. <laughs> so hold on there. Okay, sure. um, yes. um, so Soledad, if you can hear us and you're still there, uh, I think you are. Um, we have this question that um, basically says, is the intention of the adaptation targets and indicators, which are to be developed under the framework law, are they to be completed in time for inclusion as targets in the long-term climate strategy? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, the idea is to include these uh, adaptation targets and indicators in our LTS in the next year. Uh, we are working in that in our CIVIT project, we now have a new professional helping us to to develop this 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 task and also we are going to uh, contract a expert group we are going to make a consultancy process for this uh, issue uh, 
Uh, we have some studies related to indicators, but we need to organize the, this information. And the idea is to not only to define a list of indicators, but also to, to establish a system, a strong system for the development, for the uh, monitoring of uh, adaptation capacity of the country. Thank you. And the other question we received uh, asks if you ha if you know what tools are um, is the ministry and or the department using to estimate the emission reduction of the proposed activities in the long term strategy in the agriculture sector? Do you have if this is a very specific question? But if you have any idea, could you please uh, enlighten us? Yeah, that's true. It is a very specific question. I don't have a, 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 the perfect answer. Uh, uh, we are using a LEAP for modeling process. And we are working, of course, together with agriculture sector, with the Ministry of Agriculture, and also with an institute in Chile, which is, which is in charge of forestry. But I don't have the details uh, about that. I can... Yes, this is something that. we can include in the written answer. Yeah, yeah. We, we have an expert uh, professional in all the modeling process, and I can talk with him and to have a, a very detailed answer for that. Perfect. Thank you. And to finish with, we have another question for Chiara. So here comes the question, yes. and it says, what elements would you advise countries to include in the long-term strategy if their priority is adaptation and mitigation is secondary? Since your presentation is skewed to mitigation and some adaptation co-benefits, so do you have um, uh, more information about this uh, adaptation elements to be included in the LTS? Uh, unfortunately, not. Uh, yes, very sadly, uh, our presentation is really is really was really focused on, on on climate change mitigation because you know as the term of, of the term itself of the document is long term low emission development strategy. However, I do perfectly see uh, the point of uh, for some countries adaptation may be definitely more relevant than mitigation. And uh, at that point, I, I would really have no, I don't have specifically any suggestions on what element uh, this could include. But uh, on the top of my mind, I can think of all the adaptation plans that are out there developed by countries, and they can definitely include some very, some very useful um, insights. Uh, but if you're very interested in this question, please contact me and I can put you in touch with the the team at UCD that specifically works on climate change adaptation. Perfect. That's a really nice uh, offer for this. And uh, perhaps we can add a bit more to this when we publish um, the recording and we, we can maybe complete this more with some suggestions of uh, adaptation elements. So, um, I think we are now coming to the end of the webinar. Um, particip the participants, I would like to say thank you uh, for uh, attending this webinar and a special thank you to the panelists for their very informative and interesting presentations. And for this um, for this discussion, there's a uh, lot of questions and, uh, and interesting discussion and answers. So thank you all for your attention. And uh, we wish you a good day from Copenhagen. Um, goodbye and um, have a good day. Bye.